Okay, um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'd just like to welcome you all to the, uh, to the WIT Student Surgical Society's Inseparables. Um, I'd just like to welcome the esteemed Dr. Marisa de Villiers, who will be taking us through her experiences, as well as the technicality surrounding the separation of conjoined twins. Dr. de Villiers attained her undergraduate degree from the University of Pretoria and completed her pediatric surgery specialist training also at the University of Pretoria in 2011. She has always kept a close relationship with the department driven by her passion, as well as equal care to all children in the beautiful country of ours. <clears throat> in October 2021, she was appointed as the first female head of the pediatric surgery at the University of Pretoria. Without further ado, I'd like to welcome on the esteemed Dr. De Villiers. Good afternoon. Uh... I don't know about esteem, but thank you for that introduction and thank you for the opportunity to talk to you guys today. Um, I hope you find this talk interesting. If there are some technical issues, I do apologize, but hopefully um, everything will be clear and you'll be able to see. So I'm going to share my screen, I think. Let's see. Um, here we go. Um, just let me know. Can you see this? Anyone? It's still coming up, I think. Um, let's just give it a okay. moment. Perhaps unshare and reshare, that sometimes does happen on these uh, screen sharing okay. uh, services. Let me cancel that. I think I didn't click the right button. No, no problem. It's like you're presenting now and we can see everything. Okay, great. I uh, just hide the uh, little note at the bottom, I think. There Thanks. You Thanks so much. Okay, great. So, um, conjoint twins have really grabbed the imagination of people for centuries. Um, the first recorded um, story of conjoints were something like 6,000 BC. But um, the only thing that we have um, that's still, well, in one piece is this um, carving that was made of Ischiopagus twins, um, and they dated it back to about 80 BC. So you can see they joined here at the pelvis, they only have three legs. Um, they've got all the arms and they look a little bit bigger, so they probably survived um, a couple of months. They definitely wouldn't have survived into adulthood um, because there are several problems, but I'll, I'm going to present a case like this to you a little bit later. So if you're really interested in this, when one day you're in Florence, Italy, you can go and have a look at this carving. Um, and I'm sure there's lots of other interesting stuff to look at. Okay, so... It's, the word Siamese twins actually came from the most celebrated pair of conjoined twins, and that was Chang and Eng Bunker. And they were born in Siam, and Siam, um, or Thailand, used to be called Siam. So that's where the word Siamese twins com comes from. Um, and that was in 1911. So these two brothers were joined at the Ziffy sternum um, with just a piece, piece of tissue, but um, they felt that it was too dangerous to separate them um, so they were kept joined. What's interesting about them is they say that this piece of tissue stretched a little bit and they were able to stand side by side. But the two brothers were vastly different. The one was a party animal, the other one not. So um, there was a lot of tension between the two of them. And both of them had separate families. And both of them fathered something ridiculous like 10 to 11 kids. So I'll leave that up to your imagination of how they actually did that. So they would spend two weeks with the one family and then two weeks with the other family. And when the one brother died, the other ones also didn't want to be separated. And they found that it would actually have been easy to separate them, even in 1911, um, when they didn't have the advances we have today. So that's where the actual word Siamese twins comes, um, comes from. But just a little bit semantics or the classification. So if you um, talk about conjoined twins, um, so the terminology or the classification is around the place where they actually joined. 
So the suffix pagus means fixed or fastened. And they can have a different amount of lead, sometimes four, sometimes three, sometimes two, um, like that carving I showed you in the beginning, that only had three legs. Um, and then the classification is limited to about eight types. So thoracopagus joined at the chest, omphalopagus um, at the umbilicus, pyopagus at the sacrum, ischiopagus also in the pelvis, then cranio, cephalopagus, rachipagus, sparopagus. So there are lots of classifications. And if you go and Google this, you'll also find a lot of interesting pictures. And I will show you some of them now. So the first one is the raccoon phallopagus. So these twins um, were joined from the chest um, up to the abdomen. Now, the problem with this is, unfortunately, as soon as they joined at the chest, they often share the whole, either the heart or part of the heart and the great vessels. The stuff that they share in the abdomen, that's relatively easy to separate. Obviously, there are some exceptions, but when it comes to the heart, it's very difficult to separate. So you would often find that one child has the normal pumping part of the heart. The other one has like a rudimentary chamber, but then the one with the rudimentary chamber might have the big vessels. So now if you have to decide on how to separate the two, you need to, you, the first thing you have to decide is to see, can you actually separate both of them and both of them will survive, which is often not the case. And then secondly, okay, can you separate them and sacrifice the one, which unfortunately is also often not the case. So like I say, sometimes the one has the heart, the pumping part of the heart, but the other one has the vessels. So often with thoracopagus or thoracophalopagus kids, we're not able to separate them, which is quite sad. This specific set of twins, um, we weren't able to separate them and they died shortly after birth, like a couple of weeks after birth. Rachipagus is um, now again, they joined at the back at the sacral area. So now if you look at these two, two babies, the two girls, two sisters, um, if you look at the picture there, you, if, for example, you only had one baby and you see something like that sit, sitting on the sacral area, you would immediately think of maybe something like a meningocele, myelomeningocele, anything in that, in that line. So now when we see this tissue, you think, okay, it's probably not just normal tissue that joins them. There must be some neural tissue there as well. So if you look on the right-hand side, this is an MRI picture. Unfortunately, it doesn't show a lot, but you can get an idea that, yeah, at the bottom, at the sacral area, it's, they're probably sharing some neural tissue. Now, unfortunately, when it gets to conjoined twins, they're usually born premature. So they have the same issues that premature babies have. If I remember correctly, these girls were born at 32 or 33 weeks gestation. Um, so they have all the risks that premature babies can get. And unfortunately, what happened in this case was the bigger of the two babies, the one here on the left hand side, developed NEC or necrotizing enterocolitis. So some of you might know that um, this is a disease, depending on the severity, they can survive it. But if it's a fulminant one that starts quickly and then involves all of the bowel, there's very little you can do surgically. So we were still in the process of planning, deciding what to do, and the one sister developed NEC. But the fulminant type of NEC that we knew that most of the bowel was necrotic, uh, there was nothing we could do surgically to save the baby, but now we had to do an emergency separation because um, if not if we knew that this child is the one sister will die. So we had to separate them quickly before it compromised the other one. Now I'll get into the planning a little bit of, of um, separating the twins, but in this case, it not that I would say it was chaos, the separation went well. Um, the neurosurgeons were involved in this, um, Prof. Padayachi Pada did this. But in theater, it was chaos. It, lots of people, lots of people standing around, a lot of noise. Everybody knew more or less what they had to do, but we couldn't really plan for this. Um, what also happened was the kids Soon after induction of anesthesia, the baby, the sick baby, um, collapsed, arrested, and we had to do CPR while they were still joined. And um, Prof. Padayachi had to really quickly cut through here uh, without really planning or seeing where to cut or how to divide the nerve fibers. 
because we were literally keeping the one op alive, a heart pumping, so that we didn't compromise the system. As soon as they were separated, the baby died, um, and then um, the sister, they could then um, in time or calmly um, repair the defect. Um, and she did well afterwards. Craniopagus, these are the ones that I think just always fascinate people. So they usually um, um, joint at the skull or they share the skull, the bone of the skull. Um, but then obviously sometimes they can also share part of the brain. So this is also not something you're really going to rush into to separate. You want to see what they, what they share. Um, what structures are shared and it's planned um, and they kept um, in hospital often until they separated so it can be a couple many months or maybe up to a year or longer and i think um, quite a few of you might have seen um, the social media um, um, reports on the kids i think it was in south america that now was were separated in the past two or three days i think and they did a separation. And, and I, if I'm correct, it was a craniopagus. Parapagus, now this is very interesting. This has been a recent classification that they added. So parapagus means that almost it's like ventrolaterally that they joined. It's on the side that they joined and um, then it's the lower part of the body. So now if you look at these two kids, unfortunately, I mean, there's no way you can actually separate them. And to what extent you, you can probably safely separate them, but one will have one leg, maybe no legs. The other one might have both or maybe only the one. And the quality of life probably would not be that great. Um, and because they're also connected from the thorax down, it's highly unlikely that um, you will be able to separate them safely because of what I um, said before about sharing of the vessels. But this is, uh, this is an interesting um, um, connection and it's, it's very, very uncommon. Okay, so planning, just a little bit about this. You need two of everything. So you need um, two teams of that um, comprises of anesthetists, surgeons, as well as the nursing personnel. You need a theater or the room actually that's big enough to have two separate setups. So it's a full separate setup, a theater bed, an aesthetic machine, scrub sister um, with the nurse that helps the scrub sister, an aesthetic team. Um, so everything is separate and they're next to each other. And like I was saying, it's it's as great spectator value because we don't see this often. I think statistically, the amount of or the incidence of conjoint twins is not that high. So like something about one in 60 or 70,000 live births, but only 30% of those that are born are um, actually get to the point of being separated. They often die beforehand or um, they're inseparable. So then uh, it makes sense to think that this is as really great spectator value. So we literally place somebody at the door and you are vetted beforehand. If you're part of the team, you're allowed to come in. If you just want to see what's going on, unfortunately, you're not allowed in. Um, so it's really only authorized personnel. It's really stressful. If you have a stressful situation, you have a difficult surgery, if there's lots of noise going around, you can't think. So you really want to limit the amount of people and activity going around. So this is literally part of the planning. Okay, I'm going to discuss um, about three cases now. Okay, so this is also another interesting one. It's not under the classification. I think probably because they often, the one twin is not really seen as a, a viable um, baby. So it's heteropagus or parasitic twins. If you like Stephen King books, um, the dark side is about the brother or the one sibling that swallowed the other twin. Anyways, if you're into Stephen King, you, you might find that interesting. But a parasitic twin can be anything. It's anything that looks almost human, I want to say. It might be a leg, an arm that's attached to the other um, baby. Or it might be something like in the case of this that almost looks like a complete baby. But you can see it, that a child that is severely dysmorphic, so a baby that it, it's really not compatible with life. So if you look at this baby, the one on the top right hand corner, if I can get my cursor to work, um, you can see there's an encephalocele um, at the back there, and 
completely abnormal arm that you can see there. There's um, an omphalo seal is just covered with the dressing at the moment. The legs are also abnormal. So this twin, there was no way that this, this baby would survive. And if he survived, you would ask the ethical question, is it really worth a while um, to try and um, um, save this child because of all the severe congenital abnormalities that, that he had? These are um, Pyopagus tw twins, the ones where they joined at the sacrum. Maybe you can say Iscupagus, but Pyopagus. So, not well, the, for the lack of a better word, the nice thing about a parasitic twin is you know you can separate them without having to worry about the parasitic twin. So, often the problem is that you don't have enough skin to cover or tissue to cover when, you separ when you've separated them. But in a case like this, you can really go far onto the other baby's um, um, side and you'll have enough skin and enough tissue and you can do the reconstruction afterwards. But you don't really have to worry about that. So um, paras heteropagous twins or parasitic twins are separated shortly after birth. And here you can see it's a picture here, the one on the left hand side. Now they've been separated and then we can do the reconstruction. This baby was lucky, he, it really just involved a lot of soft tissue, so it didn't involve the rectum or even the muscles of the pelvis. So we were able to do um, uh, almost normal anatomical reconstruction. But now if you look at the parasitic twin, you can see it's severely dysmorphic. The face, you can't really see the face well, um, but it's abnormal. There's huge encephalocele sitting here at the back, maybe even a pentalogy of control, it's possible that the heart is in this abdominal wall defect, um, sternal defect, diaphragmatic defects, um, abnormal arm, abnormal feet. Um, so this was really not compatible with life. Okay, on fellow pagus twins, um, these were the most recent twins that um, we separated. So on fellow pagus, meaning they connected at the area around the umbilicus. And um, I think probably of all of them, they have some of the better prognosis, except if they obviously share only um, a few structures. The next couple of pictures are um, were taken by the anesthetists, um, and it was really just to show how they prepare them, how they prepare them before um, um, induction of anesthesia so that they can safely intubate both of them. So you can see both of the babies are marked. There's a purple and a pink one. And that is really just for logistics. So you get a purple team, they have whatever other purple stickers on them or purple clothes or purple hat and the pink team. It's really more about the anesthetic team and the anesthetic sisters and the assistants that you don't get confused which baby you're looking at. These kids were propped up. So I'll show you the next picture, you'll see it better. So they propped up in between two pillows and they're literally sitting straight up. They don't seem bothered much about this. You can see they're sleeping and happily sucking away. So here you can see from the sides, so they're connected in the middle, and then the pillows are on the sides to literally prop them up. And this is just really to have better access to intubate them. So again, from the anesthetic point of view, like we, from a surgical point of view, plan our surgery, we do scans and whatever we need to plan on how we're going to separate. They also plan, they look at how the kids look, um, they look at underlying problems that they might have, and they plan on how they're going to do um, the intubation. This is Prof Spikerman. She's the head of um, anesthesia at um, Tux. So now you can see her standing here. I'll show you the video as, as well now with the video laryngoscope or the CMAC. So here she has it in her hand and it projects onto a screen here. So surgery gets progressively easier if you have the right toys to play with. And this is an excellent toy for anesthetists. You don't have to bend down like with a normal laryngoscope. You can have somebody from the outside manipulating the airway so that you can see the cords better. It just makes life so much more easier. So I do hope this is going to project. So here you can see she's going in. If you look on top here at the screen, there are the vocal cords and the, the ET tube is going in. She makes it look extremely easy, but it's really so much easier, if, like I say, if you have the right toys. You can see the other baby is already intubated and somebody is securing the tube there. And now they're connecting everything, they're connecting the ventilator um, and making sure that everything is fine. You can see 
Now they're looking back at the vent, they're making sure their capnograph is fine, and they're happy that the tube is in. But at least with the CMAC, it gives you that ability of if a patient is in a weird position or if it's a difficult airway, um, it really makes it a lot easier. It's a lot of discussion going around here. You can see, see she's looking quite serious at this point, but that's often her expression. So she's not mad um, at her colleague. But now yeah, on the other side, you can see there's um, Ross Packham and the purple team. Dr. Willendahl was the pink team. Um, and they both put it, putting up A-lines on the two babies. So working very closely together, you have to have a good relationship with your colleagues. Um, otherwise, it might be a problem. But um, so both of them working the same time um, on each of their patients. So again, like I said before, when you get to um, uh, conjoint twins, they are usually premature and they get the problems of prem prematurity. So um, these twins had um, some cardiac defects. So one had a VSD, the other one an ASD and a VSD. And from an, an aesthetic point of view, this is important because it um, does influence their planning for and the, the actual anesthesia. If you look on the right hand side here, now um, they're ready um, for surgery. I'm just going to go to the next slide. So here you can see there's, there are two pipes and they go each to their own machine. They've already been cleaned now. There's some betadine on the bodies. They've, um, we've got some ortho wool to keep them warm and they've got their little missus on top to keep their heads warm. Um, there's a diathermy plate on this baby, a diathermy plate on that baby, and both of these cables go on to the separate sides. So now the, both of the teams would be involved now in separating them. So here you can see, and this is now a perfect picture of how the theatres should look. There isn't, you don't see a lot of people around. The pediatrician is standing here at the back, an aesthetic assistant, nursing, nurses um, that um, help the sister, and one sister that scrubbed and then both of our teams. It's um, my assistant and myself standing here and Dr. Stevens and Dr. Butko on the other side. So um, we're now separating them. And also you can see the anesthetic machines. Here's the one machine on the one side and the other one is on the other side. So it's a nice controlled environment. You need to control as many variables as you can, but obviously there'll be stuff that pop up. But as long as you can get the stuff you can control, you try and can control at least. I apologize about the quality. It's not um, as good. It's a little bit blurred, but it, it does give you a slight idea of what we did here. So on top of the picture would be the heads of the babies at the bottom of the feet. So these kids were lucky. They really only shared a sliver of liver, and that was all. So it wasn't much that they shared. They didn't share any bowel. They didn't share much of the liver or the vasculature of the liver itself. Um, so we basically separated um, them there, just cut through that piece that they shared, um, and then um, we covered both of them now to move to the different beds. So the one baby would have stayed on the one bed and the other one to the other bed. So if you look closely, you can see there's a dressing. We put a sterile dressing on the abdomen and we covered it um, with an occlusive dressing so that we could move the baby to the other bed. Again, anytime you move a patient, there's always, a, a, during transfer, it's probably one of the highest risk times um, during anesthesia. So you, you don't really want to transfer your child, but obviously we had to hear. You can see the anesthetist is holding the ET tube. It's disconnected from the vent, um, and then the baby is moved over to the other side. This picture you can see now we're going on both sides. Um, Dr. Stevens and myself still standing here, so um, we're ready to move over. And here you can see on the other one on the right hand side, the one team is standing on the one side and the other one on the other side. I had a pink cap up on, so I was a bit confused, although I was part of the purple team. But now again, we do everything over from the start. We scrub again, we um, put sterile gowns and gloves on again, we um, then um, clean and drape each one separately again. So this is just the preparation process again. Like I say, it's probably the anesthetic time probably took up two thirds of the time um, of the surgery time and the surgery itself was really very quick in this case. And you can see both of them lying, they're now ready um, for us to try and reconstruct the abdominal wall. So basically what we really had to do here is, was to close the abdominal wall, identify the structures and the muscles and um, close, it in, close it in such a way that the abdomen um, 
wasn't under tension and that the babies wouldn't develop compartment syndrome. And this was to result afterwards. One of the most difficult things to recreate is a belly button, which they did not have. So if you have something that looks like this, this is an excellent result. So a bit of scar tissue that will form and it'll, it'll look like a belly button. Um, but in the end, this was actually an excellent result um, of, that we got afterwards. Here's a one team, and this is after the, um, the operation was finished, and there's the other team. Okay, so the next case is ischio pagus twin. So it's they joint at the pelvis, so it's as if almost as if they're sitting on top of each other. Unfortunately, I don't have a lot of photographs um, of these babies from the start to finish. I've lost them somewhere. So at this point, when this photograph was taken, they were already um, almost a year old, and it was at the point where we were going to separate them. They um, the diagnosis wasn't made antenatally of a, um, conjoint twins, although the mom knew she was getting twins, she, she, she would give birth to twins. It was a normal vaginal delivery, so you can imagine what happened in this scenario now, so the child just kept on coming and coming and coming. I think they must have gotten quite a fright when the baby was delivered eventually. So lucky for, for them, they had all their limbs were there. It wasn't like a three or two limb scenario. They were at four legs. The problem is with the ischio pagus twins is that they share the bottom half of the abdomen and the pelvis. So there's a big chance that the urinary tract um, is shared and there might be obstruction and the same with the gastrointestinal tract. So in this case, they actually had, they had obstruction, they had GRT obstruction. So the lower part of the GRT um, was almost completely um, stenotic and they weren't passing stools adequately. There was an anus, you can't, unfortunately can't see it, it's underneath this fold of skin, um, but um, they weren't passing stools adequately. So we had to do emergency diversion colostomies um, early on um, before we were even considering separation. Another thing, with, especially with, with twins like this, ischiopagus twins, is that um, you have to now plan for the separation. So when you plan for it, you need enough skin to close. So you can't just go and take a knife and kind of whack through the central line there because you're not going to have enough tissue and skin to close the defect. So there are different methods, different types of expanders you can put in to stretch skin, maybe stretch local skin and move it as a flap. Um, in this case, we decided we're going to try and stretch the abdominal wall itself. So in the one twin, what we did was we placed a chemo port, the normal porticates that we use for chemotherapy. Um, we placed it just above the liver, just um, on the right hand side here, um, that it lies on top of the liver that you can feel um, under the skin, that you can feel the port with the actual um, tube or the lumen of the port um, lying in the abdominal cavity. And the idea was that we would inject air and stretch the abdominal cavity like this um, gradually over time that we would have more skin. So the reason why I'm telling you this story now, because the interesting thing that happened was, so we were now injecting air into the sport and then all of a sudden this child collapsed, he crashed. He was just not breathing, he didn't have a heartbeat. Um, and this was in the ultrasound department. So, if you know um, that those the um, radiology departments they don't really bargain on patients being so unstable that they would crash while you you're doing an ultrasound or something like injecting air. So we didn't have a lot of equipment. Um, we had to rush to get a monitor and ECG, and we saw that this child was in ventricular fibrillation. So he had an air embolism. So most probably when in putting the needle in the needle maybe wasn't in the port or whatever the case was, and we injected air right, right into the bloodstream. Um, and the treatment for VF is um, to defibrillate them. So we had to shock the one baby. The other one was literally lying there, smiling at everyone, staring at the screen while we were defibrillating his brother. Luckily, we got a sinus rhythm back and he was screaming blue murder shortly afterwards. But the interesting thing was that the twin wasn't affected by this electrical current at all. Okay, so the same scenario applies here again with the separation of them. You um, have two separate teams and everything is planned beforehand. Um, we were able to separate them um, successfully. 
and um, it was only with the plan of doing some future reconstructive surgery, the one had a hypospadias, for example, we had to do an anoplasty and stuff like that, but they, um, otherwise we were happy with the separation. Okay, so the reason for this slide is now just to give you an idea of how many people are involved in separation of twins. And uh, the best way I could describe it was to call it the ripple effect. Um, they usually stay in hospital for a long time, for a year, maybe even longer. I think the twins that were in the news now recently, I, th I think they might have said two years, if I remember correctly, but I just quickly um, glanced at the article. But this specific, specific set of twins were in hospital for more than a year. The picture on top here was actually the one year ce birthday celebration, and this is after they were separated. Here you can see the one standing on the cupcakes. So everybody's involved. They, the, the kids are part of the family. They're part of the ward. Um, on the bottom left-hand corner is one of the cleaning ladies. I mean, they used to come and play with the kids. And you can see they're comfortable with them. They, the kids know this lady. She's been there often. Um, <coughs> so it's not just, sorry, just the doctors and the nurses um, or the parents that are involved. And this picture, you can see that both of the parents are there. This is a physiotherapist. It's a sister that's there. Um, so it affects many people, and I'm not even talking about the papers and the news and, and the, um, just all the hype that's about separating twins. These boys were separated successfully. Here at the bottom, you can see them. Um, they were both sitting um, on the mom's lap, and they were discharged. So they went back to Bushback Ridge. Um, about three, four months later, um, the one brother developed gastroenteritis. And he actually died. He died of dehydration. They could not get a, an IV line up. I don't know why they didn't try intraosseous or whatever the case might be, um, but he died. So after all the time and all the effort and we separated them successfully, one of the twins still died of what could have been a preventable death if he was in, a, in an ideal um, situation or in a hospital that could help him. The problem with them was that, um, especially that one, the one boy was, we struggled with venous axis. So when they were in hospital, we often had to put up central lines. So now it's at a peripheral hospital, they can't get up a central line, they can't put in an intraosseous in, and unfortunately he died. So this is now the contradiction in our country between first class, first world medicine compared to, yeah, you know, we still do have the problems that we see in third world countries as well. But at least we can give the option to patients. We can um, offer them separation if it's possible. Um, and we do have success um, with separating twins as well. Okay, great, that is the end of my presentation. I don't know if anybody has any questions. I can stop sharing my screen, it'll help. There we go. Okay, so are there maybe any questions? from anybody on this panel that I'm looking at. I don't have any currently. Um, if anyone on the uh, that's currently watching on YouTube would like to submit any to the chat, um, we can wait a few moments. Um, but otherwise, thank you so much for um, coming to speak with us here today. I know it was uh, a bit of a, uh, a long time <laughs> coming. For, uh, for a certain part of it, but um, I think we'll just wait a few moments and then uh, I'll have uh, my colleague uh, wrap up with everything. So thank you so much. I think uh, due to the uh, due to the time, I think some students are probably um, watching from campus, um, so I don't think they're in the questioning of moods. Um, however, I did want to ask, um, what was your um, path to becoming a uh, well, partly a uh, conjoined twins separator, if I can if I can call that? What was your what was your pathway to your uh, where you are now, so to speak? I don't know if I'll brand myself as a conjoined twin separated necessarily. 
it often happens by accident. So it depends on where you are, um, in the hospital setting that you are in. And um, like in government setup, it, a lot of stuff are centralized. So you need different um, disciplines to be there. So a cardiothoracic surgeon or whatever, a neurosurgeon. So then the kids would come to a certain hospital or a certain um, city, and then they just happen to end up um, with us. I mean, UNITAS, how they ended up with us was the patients came from, from Swaziland. And so we had previous interactions with them, so they would contact us and we knew we could manage it at the hospital. But often, I think with any um, of the pediatric surgeons, if you, or any surgeon for that matter, when you get a referral or they want to transfer a patient, you would choose a hospital that is equipped to deal with the kids. Um, and that would de then determine who will be involved in them. So I think we were lucky in that way that, um, or I was lucky that we, I was always stationed at some place where um, we could actually manage um, the separation of the twins safely. Ah, so I see it's a, it's a mixture of uh, serendipity and yes. uh, the South African uh, healthcare system. Yeah, um, definitely. But that is quite interesting. I think that's a question that um, uh, a lot of um, our attendees and medical students in general have is that they're not quite sure how how the experience comes, uh, how they get the experience, and uh, I think your your story kind of explains that uh, experience comes to them as long as yes. they're, they're willing yeah. to, to look for it. Um, uh, but thank you for that. Um, I think we did get a few uh, questions actually. Uh, what is the real cause of conjoined twins at a genetic level? I think it's quite an involved question, but do, 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 do. <laughs> do you have yeah, that's quite a difficult question. Um, to be honest, um, it's probably better, better to go and Google it. Um, there are different theories, as far as I know, um, about why um, the two cells don't separate completely. Um, but on a genetic or embryological level, unfortunately, I can't really tell you now. Um, just from the top of my head, I, I can't really remember what those different theories are. Um, but basically, it's a twin pregnancy where the two cells didn't separate completely. And then depending on we, what part didn't separate, it's almost, I mean, even the, the Omphalopagus twins that we had, it's, you could almost think that they tried to separate, but they just didn't get that last little bit of tissue to separate. Um, but on a genetic level, if you, I think if you find that answer, you'll probably make a lot of money and be very famous. Well, not make a lot of money, you'll just be very famous, probably. Mm, I think it is a, a very difficult topic, and I think there probably is some other um, other factors that deal with it as much as um, I can't recall the condition now. I think it's the um, neural tube defects, obviously. Uh, maybe folate is just the culprit in everything. Um, uh, we have another question. Um, uh, let's see. Um, oh, we have another question from the uh, same listener uh, asking uh, if prevent if uh, joining or conjointness is um, uh, you can prevent the the joining while the mother is still pregnant. I assume um, that probably isn't a possibility yeah. via because because of the way they form, but. Is there any anything any examples of uh, uh, this concern? Yeah, I think you you you're not going to know that they conjoined until they conjoined. So if you do IVF, you can maybe prevent that because then you've got separate cells that you implant. But um, by the time that you know the twin pregnancy is actually conjoined twins, um, I mean that's too late. You won't be able to prevent that from happening. So I guess it. I don't know with IVF if they have different ways of um, preventing it, but unlikely. I mean, it's 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 something that happens with twin pregnancies, and like I say, you won't know it until much later when you can actually see that they're connected and they're just not not just two babies lying next next to each other. One hundred percent. I think uh, conjoined twins see more of a reactive versus a uh, proactive uh, kind of condition. Yeah. Um, perhaps. <clears throat> Uh, let's see. Um, another speaker asks, "Would you say the, the would you say separation is worth it if it is such a high risk operation?" 
Um, I think I'd probably add to that um, by saying, I assume that the the people who decide whether or not this is a high or a low risk is purely the, uh, the attending surgical team at the time. Do, is anyone else consulted other than obviously the the parents and such? Is there an ethical team that would need to be uh, consulted, or is it not? Is it a bit more of a clinical type of decision? Yeah, it's a, well ethical as well, um, but. Um, mainly clinical. So it's not just one person. It's not just me, for example. Um, it's a whole team. So it, it involves pediatricians, um, well, the parents, obviously, depending on what is joined, um, neurosurgeons, thoracic surgeons, um, social workers. So there's lots of a lot of people that's involved in the decision. The um, example I showed you that Thraco and Fallopagus twins that died, with them, we really had the social workers involved because it's a difficult decision to make. And it, you, the parents need to understand that it's not a case of, okay, we don't want to separate them, but that chances of one of them surviving is very little. So then it, it gets, then you get into an ethical discussion of, should you really try and separate them? And you know, both have gone and died, or should you just spare them the suffering and um, just let them die naturally, if you know that's going to be the case. So I think that's where experience comes in. And luckily, it's not just one person's decision to make. It's it's a team effort. People, A lot of people decide together. And we only make the decision when we have all the information, all imaging that we can potentially get. Um, and we really know we cannot separate them. I mean, those twins, apart from just the general pediatricians, the pediatric cardiologists were also involved. Um, so it was really a decision. People sat together and decided, okay, no, we really can't separate them. The thoracic surgeon said there's no way we can safely separate them and even have one surviving. And, and we've had cases where we would say there's a small chance of one of the babies surviving. We parents would say, no, please, we don't want any surgery. Um, we would rather um, want nature to take its course or for the babies to die peacefully and not in pain or not suffering. But if we can separate them, we definitely do. Um, there's no point in, I mean, like the, the Siam twins, the Siamese twins, they could have been separated. So they could have had wonderful lives, the one party animal, the other one not, and still father the 11 kids. And they would actually have survived if they, if they were separated. Um, but there's a fine line. And I think ugh, it's with anything in, in medicine in general or in surgery. You have to decide at what point am I now doing more harm than good and should I go ahead and do this? And is it just really because I find it interesting and I want to be in the papers or is it really in the best interest of the patient? So you, that question would always come up and how far do you go? At what point do you withdraw treatment? But that's an ethical discussion, luckily not for this talk. Yes, yes, certainly. I think we can uh, probably have a, another discussion in itself about the, mm -hmm. the pros and cons and the back uh, the back and forth and um i'm sure that uh a lot of the the medical students have probably listened to enough medical or was it medical ethics lectures for, for the week um, i'm sure they can just catch up on the ones that they've already listened to and uh come up with their own their own thoughts um i think a good one to end off with is um obviously we've heard how you've gotten to uh, be involved with such procedures but what inspired you down this career path of uh, perhaps surgery in general, being that you are uh, here with the Surgical Society? Okay. Um, I can't say that it was because of a love of children from an early age. I mean, I remember working in Ireland in the emergency department thinking, oh, I really do not want to do P. It's because kids always get sick at night. Um, I realized in my community service that I like surgery and that I'm, I'm good with surgery. I'm not a physician. I think early on, as students even, you know, you're either a physician or you're a surgeon. Um, and then you can work with that. I mean, you don't have to do internal medicine and surgery just, but you know, you like cutting or you don't. And I kind of knew from early on that I'm not a physician. So I started in, in surgery. I decided I'm, I'll, do, I'll start with general surgery. And not long into general surgery, I, I didn't really enjoy it that much. Um, and I thought maybe I can do something like head and neck surgery, some final surgery, or maybe hand surgery. Or, but with hand surgery, you need to go through the whole of orthopedics, which I didn't want to do. Um, and then I rotated. I worked a bit in feet surgery. So I thought, okay, no, this is really what I wanted to do. 
And um, I was busy with general surgery for a couple of years when they changed pediatric surgery from a certificate, that a two-year certificate after general surgery into a, a full-on degree. So then um, I, after my intermediates, I just changed over um, to pediatric surgery and um, went on from there. I must say the mistake I made was to think that <laughs> I'm going to have more time um, working on children than um, working on adults, which was not the case at all. Sometimes the surgery might be shorter, but it's not really so much shorter um, the, than what general surgery cases are. But um, what's wonderful about children and, and pediatric surgery specifically is that um, it's sad, yes, kids are born with con congenital defects, but it's not something they did to themselves. It's not as if you drank too much, you walk around three o'clock in the morning uh, on the street and you get stabbed or shot. Um, it's, they're born with it. It's a defect that they're born with. And it's not as if something broke. So you have to reconstruct something from where there wasn't anything. You don't have to fix something that was broken or try and speak to somebody that's drunk out of their mind. And you only have to, you can only use swear words to communicate with them. So that part, I'm really glad I don't have to face anymore. And then the anatomy of children, it's just wonderful to see. You can see the momentum and the vessels in the momentum perfectly. You can see the different layers of the abdominal wall. You can see the anterior and posterior sheath around the rectus uh, muscles. So everything is just still perfect, if you want to say that. Um, yeah, so that's... that's um, it's sad, yes, but it's sad for us as adults. For children, that's a reality. When you get to pediatric oncology, people would often say, but how can you work with oncology? But for the kids, most of the kids are fine. That is their reality. That's the life they live, and they make the best of it. If a child is born without a leg, when they start walking, they actually walk on the one leg. So um, children adapt much faster than we. We would sit in the corner and sway back and forth and feel sorry for ourselves where kids would bounce back quickly afterwards. So um, I'm glad that I'm in this, um, I'm happy with the decision that I made and uh, there are struggles obviously, but um, I wouldn't change it. I would still make the same choice again if I had my life to live over. Thank you so much. I think that's, um, I think your story is quite a, a comforting one to a lot of people who um, are not quite sure what they want to do and realize that um, obviously I think people have a, preconceived notion that you have to, once you get into internship, you already have to know exactly where you're going to be and how you're going to be. And um, I think um, a lot of the meandering of your, uh, of people's career choices in general is kind of swept under the rug once, um, you know, uh, surgeons get to these talks and such, and they, you know, they are already a fully formed surgeon and you um, tend to omit the the journey that took to get there. And yeah. I think uh, hearing your story and especially your your previous uh, notion that you may not have gone into this profession and end up uh, falling in love with it the way you have, um, I think uh, is uh, uh, a, de a demonstration that um, anything is possible and patience is key and um, you'll find your, you'll find your niche. Um, so I think it's a lovely mm -hmm. sentiment to, uh, to finish on. So thank you again for that. Um, I think I'll, yes. Yeah. So I just want to just add on to what you're saying now, just quickly. Um, it's, you, you do not have to specialize. And I think it's important for people to know that it's not, oh, you finish, you do, finish your internship com, com service and you have to specialize. You don't have to specialize. You can have a wonderful life as a general practitioner. You can do aviation medicine. You can work in a rural hospital and do a little bit of everything. You can do surgeries, you can do internal medicine, you can do peds. You don't really have to specialize to say, okay, now I'm successful. I've done what I, what I had to do. I mean, I um, remember, vividly remember as a final year student walking into the surgery ward and looking at a PTC drain coming out there and some fecal and vomiting over there and thinking, never in my life I'll do surgery. I ended up here. Um, but ugh, that's not the point. It's not, you, you don't have to specialize. And, and that also in the same breath, you don't have to be the best student in class to go and specialize either. It's about hard work. And I know it sounds a bit contrite, but it's really, it's true. It's 
if the, the, pe the people that are, are willing to put in the hours and the hard work are, those who are, are the ones that are successful. And they're not necessarily the cleverest people or the people that won the awards, but they are the people that are willing to put in the hours to get where they want to be. And um, maybe the past changes along the way, you think you want to be a specialist and then the next thing you find something that you love. Maybe you're going to love giving Botox. I mean, that's fine. If that's your thing, that's fine. Um, but just um, you, your life, your decision, your life decisions don't have to be made now. Obviously, you need to have an idea of where you're going, but um, you have time to make decisions. Don't rush into stuff. I think that's the end of my ethical discussion. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think that was great. I um, I almost regret not asking you sooner for, uh, for our... Uh, burnout panel discussion earlier this year but perhaps perhaps we'll we'll certainly uh have you back um we'd love to hear some more some more ethical discussions um i think um uh, if anything it's been a, another lecture uh, in itself on the um the journey of self-actualization so thank you again for that um so yes without further ado i think i will hand over to mbali and uh, uh to close close off everything and uh thank you again Thank you. Afternoon, everyone, and a good afternoon to Dr. Marisa. I would like to just extend a very big, big, big thank you for sharing your time and your expertise. It's always very special to um, hear the unique point of view that surgeons have when it comes to these rare cases. So thank you very much again for sharing your time with us. And thank you to everyone who attended and I hope you had a fantastic and enlightening time. And to all our listeners to RSVP, who RSVP, the giveaway will be done on our Instagram page live. So please turn on your post notifications. And if you don't already, please follow us just to keep updated on any of our upcoming events. Thank you very much again to Dr. Marisa and thank you for everyone. Thank you to everyone who managed to make it today.